Hugh Henry is an award-winning hedge fund manager, investment thought leader, and surfer. He founded Eclectica in 2005, a London-based global macro fund known for its high-conviction, contrarian approach. Shortly after launching Eclectica, Hugh gained recognition with impressive returns, 50% in its second year and over 30% in 2008 during the height of the global financial crisis. Although Eclectica has since closed, Hugh remains an active and influential marketing commentator. Reflecting on his commitment to creative freedom and in investing, he once said, I have always been a heretic and argued against the consensus. I've always been angry. Today we'll discuss with Hugh the investment landscape, hear his views on the US election, his skepticism towards mainstream economic policies, and his belief in the value of reading broadly as a source of inspiration for both business and investing. Hugh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. I thought we could kick off with a little bit about you and your journey so far. Uh, your facial expression was a A different journey, perhaps. And then we'll um, move across onto your views around the world. Um, and... I mean, as the girls say to me, I mean, honey, why is it all about, why is it all about you, 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 you? So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, speak less about me, but yeah, the, the heretic's mind, um, the troublemaker, um, the pirate, inevitably I find myself, um, on a, on a tropical island in the Caribbean. It, it, it seems, you know, it seems like destiny. Um, and I I closed the hedge fund in 2017, and I'm very proud that I I, I got tenure. That's not ten year, as my Scottish accent, but like ac like academic tenure. I got uh, 15 years of uh, of of managing it. Um, I mean, it was eclectic on the on the tin, and it was eclectic uh, by nature and, and, and name, the eclectic fund. And um, for those that don't. Unfortunately, the landscape of hedge funds changed, um, and I was very much a throwback to the 1970s and, and kind of, I want to say cavalier in that pirate sense of adventure um, and, and seeking out narrative and being able to invest in it. And, and that changed, and I became very much a, a specialist product, and, and my specialism was that I'm different, and I just... I don't correlate with the community, the community at large, the, the the body of professional investors. Uh, forgive me, but I call them suits. I, I see you're you're well suited and booted. Um, <laughs> that was that was never my calling. Um, and so my returns, I, I I could do anything, just not correlate. A not lose money and not correlate, if you will, with the S and P. And so think of my fund as being like a like a fire insurance on your property and and rather than you sending me money i, I sent you like for every hundred dollars of insured value i sent you about eight bucks back every year and and then if there was god forbid uh, an event a risk event then odds are that you know i would make money so i uh, my notoriety um definitely uh, assisted by uh, generating a 50 percent return in the month of October, 2008. Um, and as you say, I think you said the second year, the first calendar year, I made again, 50% um, by being on that first wave of investment uh, back into uh, gold as, it, as, the, as the, the bull market began. So, so that, that, if you will, that's me in a nutshell. Take us through how you think about today and the opportunities and cracks that you see in the cycle. Yeah. So the heavens uh, today, I mean, wow, Trump, <laughs> wow, the American stock market, I mean, just wow. Um, but wow, the performance of, of equities these last 10 years. And of course, um, when we talk about equities today, it's the rest of the world. It's the S&P only, right? It's the S&P only, yeah. And so we're com we've compounded, I think, just under 11% per annum. Uh, and to put that into context, were that to continue, so if you have a million dollars in 10 years time, that million dollars would be like 2.7 million. I mean, this is, it's been the gift that's kept giving. 
Now, uh, we're reaching kind of metrics of elevation, you know, which are historically off the chart, not at the top of the chart, but off the chart. And my favorite, just for its simplicity, is the Buffett ratio, you know, the market cap uh, of the US stock market to GDP. And we're about 2.3 times. And the ramifications of that can even be seen in the outpourings, very unusual outpouring, but Goldman Sachs, I mean, Goldman Sachs is in the show business uh, arena. It's like, hey, you know, buy equities, pay, pay us money, you know. Uh, and they've scaled back their, um, their 10 year prospective returns. And I'm kind of doubting myself. Maybe I've got this kind of filth, prejudicial filter. I hope not. But I want to say that they're, they're down at like under 2% compound annual growth rate. Uh, for the next 10 years. Three, now, it, I think, is his target. Is it, is it three? Um, now, that 2.7 million that you would have in 10 years' time, if it's three, you know, it, it, it doesn't even have a two handle. So so that's a concern. And and I did call it the Buffett ratio. And, and everyone's all, it's a head scratcher that, that Warren's got, you know, the, the sage of old, old Omaha has got so much cash. But I mean, really, you know, he, he sits at the crap table. He's very good at odds and probabilities. And I guess he's using that that old adage that the best way to double your money um, is, is to take the cash out of the casino, fold it in half, and put it in your pocket. Um, because, you know, inevitably, um, there will be a correction. Um, and that correction would be um, if you can allocate into corrections. And when I say correction, at least 20% decline in the S&P then that's going to help bolster and help get you closer to perhaps the, the 10% historic return from equity. So, so just now, um, it's scintillating. Everyone wants to be involved. And, um, and if, you, if you compare it to like 40 years ago, so 40 years ago, everything was very, very cheap and, and no, one owned every, no one owned anything and there was no compulsion to own anything. And today, everything is preposterously expensive or highly rated and, and everyone owns it and they want to own more. So, you know, the cyclical sweep of time, um, but it's a lifetime um, and from day to day, it's, it's, it's profoundly slow and frustrating, but on a tropical island, time passes slower. And so I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm on the, I'm on the, on the edge looking in with regard to equities. Um, I'll wrap up, but the, um, the only risk asset. So by risk asset, I mean your short volatility. If there's a risk event, you're going to lose money. The only risk appetite that I, I have appetite for, and I, I've pursued for a while now, has been in the what I call Bobby Digital, in, in the Bitcoin. Um, and um, and I maintain that. I maintain that. You know, like I meet a lot of kids, a lot of waiters and waitresses, and I'm like, oh, what should I do with my money? And I'm like, you should put everything into everything that you have that you can afford, you know. In, into the Bitcoin because it might just be the best investment you ever made. And I can, you know, we can pursue that later. I've been trying to fill that out for you. When, when, when crisis comes, how do you make money? And what goes down the most and what goes up the most? Yeah. Well, you know, the, I think you're off. Your starting point is a little bit off. Uh, the first rule is just not to lose the money. You know, um, if you fail on that, then it's all uphill because, you know, if the, if the market drops 50%, which is, you know, once every kind of, it used to be once every 50 years, we've built a volatility machine. I'm sure the, the frequency of that now is, is more rapid. Um, but, you know, if the market falls 50%, you, you, you've got to double your money to break even again. So first, first thing is um, don't lose the money. And, and I think we've 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 hinted that with uh, the Berkshire Hathaway raising the, the cash reserves. Uh, that that's that's the the first port of call. Um, where do you lose money, or where do you get really angry that you're losing money? Um, I want to say you typically lose money in the perceived uh, risk-free asset. Um, and his, I mean, what is history? But if we go back to 2008 and i was very very active then um and and very few people had a sense of what what was to happen but those who did they owned gold 
and um, and gold ultimately was rewarding, but heavens, you know, I want to say between possibly July and November of 2008, I think gold may have gone from just around about a thousand dollars to 650. And that you were meant to be, you know, that's what 35% draw or something. Um, but it was amplified by the fact that you were actually hoping to make a profit, a, a positive gain to offset the losses elsewhere. So the, the, the risk arbitrage, if you will, was a disaster and you lost money on, on both sides. So again, that comes back to just have less, less in the game. And, and then you do need a risk premium. You, ne you need a sense of investor revolt, you know, something that people really don't like because um, likes and dislikes or viruses, they go around, you know, they're, uh, they're popular out there. Um, and so the, the revolting asset is, is less commonly held and therefore there's less selling pressure. And, and so in the context of today, um, <laughs> I think everyone, anyone that knows me knows what I'm going to say, but I would say it's, it's fixed income, it's U.S. treasuries. Um, but before we reach for the, the long end of that curve, um, I, I mean, you were very, very definite when you said when the crisis comes, maybe it doesn't come, but like when, for this approaching crisis, I guess my favorite fixed income investment is in the red sofa contracts. So that's the old, um, what do we have is what do we call it? Uh, the, the, the dollar interest rate contracts. And that would be for red would symbolize December of next year. And, and then, but the, the market's so damn efficient, you've kind of got to be contentious. And so my contention would be, and where I'd have a, an investment, kind of tail investment would be uh, Fed rates below 2% by the end of next year. And I think there's like a six to eight times payback um, um, on swaptions and the like in there. But there are other things which, again, we can we can throw into the mix later. To be contentious over here, sometimes it's easy to be early. If you've found yourself early in the past, and what lessons have you learned? I mean, I'm many things, but let me tell you, I'm number one. I'm early. <laughs> uh, and... and and the um, what do you learn? You, you got to learn to um, to deal with being mocked, you know, being disdain. Oh, he's that guy. He's that guy that's early. Um, and so we work on it. But um, but again, into this theater of rehearsing the future. That's what I mean. That's what we're doing here. Uh, we're trying to not have a captive mind, but a mind that's expansive and um, is rehearsing scenarios. Um, and in terms of lessons and the like, what, what I, what how I learn, um, what, what I've learned is that the, the contentious assets, um, the, so what I major again on is failure. And I, I think that was hard for, well, wasn't that, that was quite hard for me to say, let, let me put it more succinctly. Uh, I practice in being a world-class loser. Yeah. Uh, and so at first blush, you're like, yeah, I can see that you're doing a good job. OK, but again, let me expand upon that. Um, in the risk business, you're going to lose. You know, you're going to lose a lot. Um, and so it's kind of important to focus and bring it into the spotlight. You know, like an alcoholic, the first thing you've got to say at AA is, you know, I'm Hugh Hendry, I'm an alcoholic. I drink too much, you know. Uh, so I'm Hugh Hendry and I make mistakes. I'm merrily. Um, and a lot of my trades go wrong, okay? But I know that, and therefore I work on it on an ex ante before, beforehand. And so I scale and I, that, that, that shapes and forms the investments that I take. And so what I, by being world-class, what I mean is that the cost of my failure is not that great, not that great. Because with the contention, I'm largely expected to be wrong. So being wrong, the penalty for being wrong for me it's not a big deal, but the penalty, let's say you're Microsoft, an investor in Microsoft, the penalty that it has a 1.5 to presently is around, let's call it $3 trillion. And what I find the absurdity of today's market is uh, markets are all, if you will, some, some, to simplify it, 
a bell curve, a normal distribution, and if and um, like the present market cap of Microsoft is three trillion dollars, and that's that's in the middle of the bell, and you've got right hand tail, and you've got left hand tail, um, and the right hand tail is that oh my god, like Microsoft's going to be a six trillion dollar company, and given its prominence, I have to own it. Because if it's six trillion, I'm underweight. I'm I'm a mutual fund manager. Boom, lights out. So everyone's protecting the right tail. Um, and I, mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to happen in a an investable uh, a time time frequency that I find appealing. Uh, but my emphasis is on the other side, and I and I find so when when you look at the skew between those two outcomes, betting on it being one and a half trillion is actually less onerous. So that would be an example. And is it just in equities that you think like that, or is it? Do you bring it through to other asset classes? It's always that mindset of investor expectations and how do you um, and and predicting where they're going to be positioning for. So it, it's um, it's all asset classes, all asset classes. But let me. Um define asset classes for me because uh, I'm, I'm not I'm excluding private equity I'm, when I say asset classes it's a deep liquid market uh, because I I have to I, I've got another superpower which is I, I, I change my mind all the time you know I'm not wedded as, and so um, the cost li liquidity is important and I am willing to reject absolutely everything I tell you today I'll, I could reject it tomorrow you know the Keynes thing the, the facts change but the facts don't change just that the, the price doesn't feel that that good um, St um michael steinberg who was a legendary 70s 80s operator um, um they all did this they come in one day and just say close everything down take it all off so hard that you know it's really hard like one of my great inspirations is the original hedge fund manager jesse livermore um, now i mean you know we're going back 130 years you know um, but he had a playfulness. He was a, a successful short seller. Um, he would go long before going short. He'd go long because the mind is this weird, weird, like prejudice and bias. Um, and you think you got it. And so you, you've got to keep testing yourself. Um, and there were times where being long is like, you, you, it opens up other neural pathways and you think, oh yeah, I was wrong. And again, remember, you are going to be wrong a lot. Um, so playfulness with curiosity and, and seeking contentious assets because there's a different and more rewarding skew in terms of the outcomes is kind of what I'm about. And, and that applies to all assets, but my world all assets means where there's a liquid market and little old me can, can you know, it's not a big deal for me to get out of position. But, but that has been a theme over time for you, isn't it? That you've never really been a you eclectic, eclectic was predominantly equities, but you were never all just about equities or rates or fix or uh, FX. It's, it's always been about everything. Well, I mean, eclectic was was multi asset was a, a global macro fund, um, but you're correct in that. Um, Equities have a risk premium. They have a positive risk premium. They they actually do reward you. The question of the quantum of reward, but the ex ex ante is like, well, yeah, here's a bribe. You want some money? Uh, you know, own me. You don't get that. You can, but it's is less clear cut cut in the commodity uh, market where you are engaged in futures. You know, volatility, uh, futures contracts, and so when there's a futures contract. Um, no one sells you the spot. They sell you everyone's expectation of three months forward, let's say, and, and there's typically a premium. So there's a there's a negative uh, risk premium. You're actually you're paying. Say, hey, look, can I come in and take risk? Whoa, and that's kind of dumb. And FX is, um, can be can be similar. Um, so bonds, of course, different. There's a risk premium, uh, and bond market was a, a significant source uh, of profit. Uh, the curve in the curve, the forward curve in gold is typically flat. And so there's just no risk premium, but there's no negative risk premium typically, which helps it. So, yeah. 
You, you've talked about deflationary sh- shocks and your concerns around men in the past. Shocks. Social media and deflationary shocks. And oh, deflationary shocks. Do you, still, shock. do, you, do, you, do you still harbor those concerns or are they changing? Wow. I mean, that's an incredible question. I mean, like Chinese ten years, like what two point one five German boons are like, like trying to get below two. Japan, you know, like came to the poker table and got slapped by people like me. We're like, you guys got nothing. <laughs> they came to the table in when was it uh, July? Idiots like raise rates twenty five basis points. Like, oh, you're we're, we're, we're hiking. No, you're not. No, you're not. Pants on fire, liar, liar. Um, the um, the world is engulfed in profound deflationary pressure. So let's back up a bit. Um, our world, and by that I mean, kind of by extension, our generation or whatever. I'm never quite sure on people's ages. I'm I'm kind of I'm getting younger. Um, but the the returns of the last forty. 40 years, four decades, have been essentially defined by the rise and rise of China. And at the heart of asset price movements really is a, a profound flaw in trade policy, and it's a flaw that was uh, recognized by John Maynard Keynes in the closing stages of Bretton Woods. He said, you, you're, you're essentially replicating the flaws inherent in the gold standard, and we're kind of here to replace it. And we're replacing it like for like, this this will fail again. And the principal failure is that Keynes and, and if you will, by like, you know, I will take the great man's shadow. Um, Keynes was very much pro global trade, very much pro uh, global mobility of labor, very much pro global mobility of ideas and sharing of knowledge and very, very anti the global mobility of capital, and especially sovereign capital, have open trade borders, but run a closed capital account. Uh, because if you don't, then China has essentially, uh, you know, the, the Triffin dilemma, there, there are three things that you can control, you know, your currency, your domestic interest rates, and something else, you know. Um, and China went, ah, you know, w- uh, we want to control the exchange rate because we are mercantilist and we our growth engine always has to be at base it has to be exporting to to other countries because um and i'm going to show prejudice here but i i i think there's basis to it but um you know Ch- china is um it's not a democracy and it's seeking to perpetuate the the one state party and it kind of it's fearful when you're seeking the perpetuity of governance, you actually fear enriching the the household sector too much. You like to just keep them kind of like a, the, the frog in the jacuzzi sort of thing. Um, and so they have um, they they have marshaled all of the significant uh, foreign exchange reserves from their very, very successful trade policies. Um, and they have bought US dollar assets predominantly treasuries, but, you know, uh, everything else. And that money, so, and what they buy is they buy treasuries. They, they're they not, the the safe, the People's Bank of China, or whatever, you know, the uh, the central bank, it's not a hedge fund. It's, it's not on 220. You know? It's not like smoking cigars. It's like, it's number one job is delivering uh, tenure to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and so its job is to keep the currency super 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 preposterously undervalued and 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 keep the engine of growth and therefore keep the people in the jacuzzi kind of happy hey temperature in here is fine you know um but when you buy treasuries so we have uh i i maintain that very very few people perhaps no more than five people in the world truly understand uh uh money and maybe it's six maybe it's seven maybe it's three you know let's call it the famous five or the infamous five um, but there's, and so when people talk to you about liquidity indicators, right, they're frauds. If you've got anyone on the show and they're talking about liquidity indicators, they're frauds. 
Um, liquidity is created by rising prices, but and, and if you got people saying, "I'm really worried about M2," I, I want to say they're frauds, but my my great hero, the legend Stan Druckenmiller, a former partner of Soros and you know the legend of the the Deutsche Mark sterling trade, etc. Um, I mean, he he comes out with this nonsense. Oh, M2, M2, right? M2 is defunct. M2 is largely immaterial. And all the uh, we look at M2 because it's U.S. deposits for the banking, the domestic regulated banking sector, the purview of the Federal Reserve, and the, and a, and a deposit for a banking institution is a liability. You you kind of have to pay money on it, and so you do. You are therefore asset seeking to compensate for that. Um, and, and so people see deposits going up and they're like, well, the assets would be making new loans to the private US uh, or to the public, uh, to the government as well. And so they see a movement in, in M2 and they say, oh, it's, that's the creation of dollar, dollar credit, which can manufacture higher and sustainable higher uh, consumer prices. Um, over the last four decades, again, that has changed that the a predominance of dollar, new new dollar creation is conducted offshore, is conducted in an unregulated matrix that we refer to as the euro dollar system. A big, big hub is Tokyo. Um, and every day new dollars are being created. And, and how it works is a little bit like a, a pawn shop. And, and you go to the pawn shop and you're like, hey, look, I've got these ear pods. And I'm really, I'm hard up, right? Like, how much will you give me? Like, they cost me a hundred bucks. And, and this... A pawn shop, and they're like, yeah, I'll give you a hundred bucks back. Now, in the euro dollar system, you are pre presenting typically um, sovereign bonds, and and money in our world, the global collateral of the world, resides within U.S. treasuries, and so everything. Let, let's say this is a, a Bueno Tesoro, the the BTPs, the Italian ten year, the most, I think the second or third most liquid uh, bond market in the world. So liquidity is very important. Um, the 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 bueno bueno. I'm my Italian is not very good. The BTP is regarded as money, i.e., its likeness to a U.S. Treasury is deemed to be one for one. Or, I mean, it can fluctuate, but where we've been in an environment where, like, hey, I've got a billion BTP ten year. If I put that in deposit with you, how much dollar credit will you give me? And they're like, man, we'll give you a billion dollars. And that's the creation of dollars uh, today. Now, there is absolutely no investment demand, like real. Like, hey, let's go and build a factory, you know. Um, because again, it's, it's really, you know, like it's the hardest thing, like when you're here or when you find yourself uh, lacking synchronicity with your hero and Stan just now, I just, I don't get Stan. And Stan's short the 10 year. Um, and he, he, he reasons that why doesn't the yield so the yield today is like four and a half percent um why doesn't it match nominal gdp and nominal gdp is about six but stan can conceive of it accelerating with the trump thing and inflation maybe being three and you can get like seven seven and a half percent so you know figures higher than the prevailing yield now that sounds logical and you know to, to the folks watching this show and thinking about the world of investment is not fair. It's a really dumb business. Um, and one of the great traps of this business is actually respecting it too much, actually assuming that it has logicality. And, and some of the, the worst mistakes I've made have been uh, getting myself involved in situations where the outcome is so logical. But you know what? The universe takes your logic and it spits it out. It says, ah, oh, you idiot. Yeah. And so whilst it's logical, for the last 40, 50 years, there has been zero relationship in the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield and nominal GDP. If you go back 40 years, it was way above. And, you know, for the last 25 years, it's been way below. And the reason for that, again, is China. Uh, and, in, and there we have to bring in a very old uh, Swedish economist, uh, nuts. <laughs> Was he nuts? Is he? Am I nuts? Wixel, Wixel, and the natural rate of um, natural rate of many things, but uh, for this purpose, the natural rate of profits. And and so when you have again back to Keynes and bread and woods and the flaw and the trade policy, uh, 
when you have a a, so, a a roguish sovereign state, which now, of course, is the same size as the entirety of Europe, um, and it's not motivated by profits. It's motivated by the the tenure and and the perpetual insistence that the communist Chinese Communist Party is kept in power, and so profits are foregone, uh, and so. And one of the manifestations of that is overinvestment in mainland China in everything. Um, you know, uh, by at the end of the last century, Nokia was like top five largest companies in the world. Um, fell like 90, 95%. So did Amazon. Amazon went from pre-split from 115 to like $4.60 incredible but where is amazon now like on that basis amazon probably is like 600 but nokia is still on its ass right well why because amazon is a is a domestic us service consumer household business nokia had the the misfortune of being in an industry which was deemed um, of of great sovereign significance to the chinese which was base station software and you know the uh, and the whole you know the, our world doesn't work without the G's you know the five G or the four G, and and you had two two players essentially, Nokia and Ericsson, and the Chinese came in and said no we want this business and we will have global leadership, and we will forego profit. Nokia sits still like on its ass. That happened in solar panels. It's happening now in electric vehicles. So when I want to say to you the natural rate of profit profitability outside the i'm going to use the japanese term zytec outside the manufacture of financial earnings via stock rebuy uh, repurchases outside the fact that interest rates have collapsed over the last 40 years um underlying profitability is is not at the level where you think oh i'm atlas i'm i'm going to invest i'm going to build things the big investment boom just now is North America, and it is government sponsored. It's being subsidized. People are like, yes, yeah, you want to pay the bills, sure. Oh, green it. Yeah, you want, you want, set, you want chips, you want semis with your burger. No problem. But you know, pay me. So that's why I think Stan is wrong. And the big issue is, can the U.S. be an island? How long can it withstand? This profound pressure that is very, very evident offshore in, in Europe and China. And I think the Fed is hyper focused on this. Um, that's that's how I would interpret uh, the 50 basis points cut in September. Um, they were kind of hamstrung by the elect the timing of the election and the last cut, but they went 25. I think they'll go 50 again. What the Fed are desperately seeking is actually what every global macro manager is seeking. And you know, it was the source of my profit in October 2008, which was a steepening in the in the yield curve. The the, the distance between the yield on the 10 year and, and cash, if you will. Um, the, the Fed's great nightmare is what happened in China. Um, the 10 year, the five year, the two year, they all came down in a parallel manner. With, uh, almost with a, a compression in the yield, um, like to the, to the lows, and, and they seem to be still skidding lower. And that takes the valuation of your banking sector uh, from a premium to NAV to like 25% uh, of NAV. And, and, it, it, and it destroys uh, risk-seeking behavior in the credit mechanism. And so the Fed, I think, is coming in with a bit of that... Um, Heavens, what's the, the, the Nobel economist guy? Krugman. Krugman went to the Japanese at the beginning of QE, the, the turn of this century, said, promise to be re be convincingly reckless. Kind of run around going, I'm crazy. I mean, they should make me the Fed for, uh, chair. Like maybe Trump, maybe I'm going to get that call. Oh, no, I'm not American. Do you have to be American to be the president of the Fed, the Fed chairman? Don't know. Probably. Um, be convincingly mad. And I think that's the... Fed's game plan, because despite, I mean, here we are, are is the S&P up 27% or something on the year to date, give or take? Um, but I, 
we, we miss the fact that over the summer, the tenure dropped like 160 basis points. It began to feel the gravitational pull. Now, it will feel, I'm saying gravity, the gravitational force is the rest of the world. I'm an I'm a institutional savings company in Germany, Belgium, China, Japan, Singapore. I can get 7% on a US mortgage. I'm not getting on a German bond or you know, a Japanese bond. So that wave of money, of course, is going to have an Im impact at some point on the on the treasury yield. Um, and, and again, like in the China experience, the whole curve just moved down in a parallel fashion. So I that's why I come back to my. F is it my favorite trade? But like, I think the quintessential macro position today wouldn't necessarily be curvature. The two is 10. It would actually just be outright like uh, Fed funds going to be like in the in the vicinity of two. I'm going to be positioned there and I'm going to have some swaps. And if it actually goes below two, boom, I, I get a huge payback. Coming back to the EV um, topic, isn't that an ex existential crisis for Europe? So much of Europe has been about the automobile, basically, whether we acknowledge it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and they, they've tolerated this. Your prosperity with prosperity comes the toleration of incompetence. Um, we have immense clusters of prosperity today, like 25% of the world, or 20%, 25%, probably less than 25% of the US population are like ecstatically rich and getting richer. And, and everyone else has no prosperity. Again, why? Keynes, bread and woods, China, perpetual trade surpluses. Uh, the recycling of trade flows into the purchase of risk-free securities, which are then transmitted by the euro dollar system. They create credit. No one wants physical investment, so it funds speculative investment. And so we, 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 we move from an entrepreneurial to speculative society, just described the last 40 years. Uh, the election of Trump, you know, the disintegration of the German party, the Brexit, uh, that's telling you that the there is no prosperity for, for the many, and which has made um, the inflate the COVID inflation has been intolerable, absolutely intolerable, um, and 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 so they, they're not stupid. They they know Trump is, you know, deplorable. Um, but but it's like I will, I will choose anyone that's not you. You, you can't even. Speak be unscripted. You can't go on the Joe Rogan show and just be you. Like he's in Mar Mar. He's in Mars Mars Alago, whatever they call Mar Alago. <laughs> uh, but you, you may you're in a bigger ivory tower. You know. Now the yeah the disappointment with um, with the sponsorship of someone like uh, Musk is he's a smart dude and he's kind of crazy. And he's fallen for this, um, you know, the tariff. You know, we were talking about deflation on that as well. Um, the, the, the tariff shows you the vestiges of power. It gives you a gap behind the curtain. Um, you know, money runs Washington. And, and where's the money? The money is found. The closer and closer you are to Wall Street, the more and more and more and more and more of the money. Yeah. Um, and and Wall Street likes the status quo. Last 40 years, S&P's gone up, what, 25, 30 times? Bring it on, bring it on. Um, so we get this preposterous uh, tariff on trade. Now, again, what did I say earlier? The trap of logicality. We're like, yeah, I'm going to make sense. Okay, so let's try and take it down. We did do that. That was that was Trump 1.0. Where are we with that? Okay, and and it's very easy to circumvent. It was it was actually of all things, it was a good article in the Financial Times by Robin Brooks uh, the other day. I mean, China controls its exchange rate and it just devalues. It devalues enough to to make it you know like go away. Now, devaluation of the Chinese currency is an, another profound source of deflation globally. And it's deflation in, in the labor pool and it's inflation in the capital pool. So 
like the Democrat. I mean, like you know, not that not that I, you know, I I, I try and be apolitical, uh, but you know, they are they're all morons. You know, some are more entertaining. That's the only some are willing to go on chat shows and be themselves. Okay, but um, but I come back to the point. It didn't really matter who won. And it, it matters philosophically if you're a passionate, passionate Ayn Rand advocate. Um, I'm kind of close to that. Um, but I, I wouldn't wish to take ownership of what I'm going to say. But I mean, like you're in, you're in Disney World. You're like, wow, you know, we're eliminating all those idiots. And, we, I'm, and we're bringing, bringing in other idiots, but they're, they're idiots that can, can recite Ayn Rand. Um, but it's all a lie. I mean, I know it's a lie because no one is proposing putting a tariff on capital. You want to, you want to, so to put a tariff on capital, you attack the 25%, like the people are richer than richer than richer than richer and richer, and richer right? And you say, you know what, it's Buggins' turn, Biggins' turn, it's like, come on, let's help the little guy, right? Um, so you put a withholding tax on, um, uh, on, on treasury, particularly sovereign treasury investment. Um, the, you will, cure the malaise and you go back to to Keynes that's what Keynes was like close your capital account go for trade but close your capital account um and we will get there um we will destroy money we will destroy democracy we will destroy brotherly sisterly neighborhood communities but and and actually that's when that's when it the 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 denunciation comes. So this whole notion that the U.S. enjoys uh, this exorbitant privilege, it can print its own dollars, bunkum. It, it is actually weighed down by this exorbitant cost of, of keeping its capital account open. Uh, exorbitant for the many and, and, and a privilege for the very few, but the very few control the vote. So um, ultimately, the, the system will, um, will rectify when, when we close the capital account. So give us a tariff on capital. But I, you know, like the the Democrats were tariffs on 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 trade. The Republicans are are tariffs on trade because they're all financed by Wall Street. That's probably a, a, a useful segue into Bitcoin at this point and being the asset of choice in that uh, in that environment. Yeah, and. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thing with Bitcoin, um, so I, I might look, I, do I look like one of these Bitcoin idiots? I don't know. Idiots, what can I say? Like, we're all idiots because we, we never bought it. Um, um, Bitcoin, remember I said earlier, I said um, seeking contentious posture, something that riles people. People get angry. They're very passionate, you know. Um, Bitcoin's got a lot of that. Um, I'm I'm not one of the brothers that can tell you about, you know, the transfer of electrons and neurons and open ledgers and you know whatever, right? Um, I'm a macro strategist, and I have I came to the conclusion eighteen months ago that um, Bitcoin had persisted enough. Um, whereby it was most likely that it would be accepted as an asset, an independent asset class within the alternative asset space as a competitor to, to gold and that no one under the age of 40 or you know like barely you know uh, no 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 statistical significance of people under the age of 40 would buy gold rather than bitcoin um, and so then if we keep it very very simple in the overvaluation of everything the absolute mass. So you know, th we're trying to propel. We're trying to participate in the propulsion of energy and energy from credit, credit creation, being transformed or transferred into the energy of asset price expansion. And I said at, at the beginning, yeah, kind of in the casino, and I'm folding my money to double it, and I'm walking out because. And I said to you, I think I I suggested mass. I, I said to you that the quantum of total stock capitalization, if I had to buy every US stock today at market, I need $53 trillion. And the US economy is about you know, somewhere between 26 and $28 trillion. Yeah. So we're comparing two flows 
which are, you know, you know, they, they should move together. And it's a nice, reliable indicator over time. It's got nothing to do with conventions and assumptions. It's a, it's a fact. And, and what we know is the mass, the, the size of this damn thing is so enormous that the amount of energy to, you need exponential amounts of energy to keep this thing moving in a linear manner, even in a linear manner. And energy comes from uh, credit, the mechanism of credit. Now, what we haven't dis what we haven't actually named or shamed is dollar yen, the currency. Uh, we are witnessing a one in a hundred year type event in dollar yen, and no one talks about it. You know, the yen has devalued by the by thirty percent. No yen. Let me say that again. The yen has gone from one fifteen and is heading back to the lows of. Uh, 162. I think it takes one. I think it will take 162 out. And uh, yeah, I'm the kind of provocative wireism adventurer that says the draw of the big number will take it to 200. And you're like, well, yeah, uh, what? I just been to Tokyo. I was in Tokyo 10 days ago, and it's cheap and it's orderly and it's amazing. This time it's going to go to 200. Yeah, I'm going to go to 200. And you're like, wait, hold on, hold, hold, hold on, fella, hold on, fella. Uh, um, yeah, like, <laughs> what's happening here? You know, this is crazy. Um, and, you know, the, the, the largest holders of U.S. Treasury bonds in the world are Japanese. Logicality trap. You, you, you know, you can own something physical, but you can use it as collateral and actually be very, very, very short. Which, like, you know, the normal investors don't really it's, it's hard to, to wrap your mind around that um and i want to say to you that you know so we, we know of the japanese malaise this economy has done nothing for uh three decades japanese banks smoke a lot of cigarettes and they're like i've 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 had it with japan i'm, I'm never investing in this goddamn place again um and but you know they, they got to earn their bread and so uh, whenever there's a foreign adventure over, whenever there's a mishap, you know, the, the Asian tiger crisis in uh, 97, 98, uh, you know, the first thing that blew out was Japanese bank credit spreads. Um, now, the spreads are doing nothing just now. I mean, again, the wall of money, there's, there's, it's all noise, no signal. It's very hard to find signal. Um, the signal today is found in the mad profits, maybe, you know. Uh, by the by the sometimes there are turning points and it's the crazies that see things but um the i want to say to you that the chinese trade policy they're buying risk-free securities the u.s is issuing risk-free securities risk-free securities are going going into this euro dollar system and it's got euro in it which is confusing but the biggest hub in the world is tokyo and the japanese banks are enormous and they're like oh you know let's make some money and so they keep going to the pawn shop and and so that let's just stop for a moment and just say two words quantitative easing we're presently in the system of the reverse quantitative tightening but quantitative easing you know all, all the gold fanatics you know weimar weimar inflation we're, we're doomed we're doing we're, we're, we're printing money and here we are 24 years later and uh, it's not that obvious that they're printing money. They're printing inert bank reserves that uh, which have the facility to be used as collateral to make loans. And when you make a loan, you're printing money. But there's no appetite. And again, one of my, I, I hope I, I mentioned to you, I uh, expound upon playfulness and curiosity. And so big words for me are paradox and irony. And wouldn't it be ironic that the, um, the the country that first went into QE was the first one actually that had some form of hyperinflation? And how that happens is you've sat there for 24 years. It's like you're in an igloo. You're in the Arctic. But there's a puddle of paraffin. You know, paraffin is that highly combustible like diesel or whatever. And, you've, and there's this, and you and your buddy, and there's a set of matches, and you are freezing. You're freezing. And you're like, God, just if we just get a little bit of heat off the match. Um, and eventually, like, you and your buddy, like, 
I cannot bear the coldness anymore. You boom, yeah. And so that that <laughs> appalling metaphor. But um, I think that the I so what I my understanding, and you're not going to read this anywhere. Um, but my understanding is that eventually the Chinese actually got fed up not using these inert JGB bank reserves. And when the cigarette, they went to the, the pawnbroker and like, I mean, I'm, I'm Mr. Yen. I've got quadrillions of, of, of JGB overnights. What will you give me in return? And yeah, understandably, the banking counterpart is like, JGB is our strongest treasury. We'll, we'll give you one for one, no haircut. So then you get the dollar collateral. And then what you do is you start making loans and you, and you start funding every speculative bull market in the universe of risk going back the last 20 years um and and all your domestic japanese banking clients corporate clients what are they doing they're building factories in china and i was saying china is amazing and if we go back 12 years ago china was going to overtake the world you know the fights i had with intellectual thought leaders in the financial circus um a logicality trap yeah we're, we're in for it and, and so one of the things that, that rings true is, you know, I said to you, dollar yen's gone from 115 to, I think today we're about 154, 155. Do I hear 156? Um, and the, when you look at the point where it started to, 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 to weaken, it, it almost to the day, it coincides. I think August, 20 fun, the t- August 21st, 2021, maybe wrong on that, uh, was when the, the wider world grew to hear about the horror story of Evergrande in China um, and and missing payment and having $300 billion of outstanding debt. I want to tell you that Japanese banks via this euro dollars matrix, credit matrix, uh, heavily involved. And and that was 21. Here we are approaching the end of uh, 2024. And counterparties now, they they, they view the, the yen differently. They're seeing these move these sensitivities and so every, and every day in the euro dollar whilst they give you credit the bank or the pawnbroker is like come back tomorrow we're gonna we're gonna review this tomorrow and and at the margin the jgbs are losing their moneyness which is to say that the counterparty is insisting that you have to pony up some dollars now you've got to pony up dollars you've got to sell yen assets and buy dollar assets and I would say to you, that's the manifestation of the dollar yen. Um, and you know, I, I say it goes to two hundred. Like, bad things coming on it. Bad things coming. You know, and and here we are, and all the rich people are all Trump supporters. The world cannot, it can't get any better. Like I, I got into Jesus, me and my, me and my my big mouth. But I got interviewed by the New York Times, um, just after the election of Obama. And I think it's very comparable, you know, the, 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 the great liberal. And I, and I said, he was, I, I was trying to depict what you're looking for emotionally uh, in trying to find a, a valid short position. And I was saying, I mean, he was literally carried into public office on the show, elevated on the shoulders of his brothers and sisters. And it's like, can, does it get any better than that? And, you know, like, I, I think the same applies today. And, and so Obama's problem wasn't him being Obama. It was that exaltation meeting the macro condition. And the macro condition when he was elected in October 2000 or November 2008, it wasn't too good. And, you know, Trump, like, you know, say, like, Elon was the president. Elon, even Elon meeting the macro condition, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, so that's, again, I'm, I'm fading things. Um, so cut to the chase um, because I'm not a lone sniper. I'm not like, I, I don't believe there's like just one magic red pool, whatever. I mean, there is, but you know, um, there's a, you, you, tr- you try and stay in the game and have some balance. And so I'm saying to you, like, if you will, my two positions there, are they polar opposites? I'm not sure. That conceivably there's something to it but i'd be seeking convexity in the contention that the federal reserve will cut rates dramatically quickly 
um, and therefore I'm betting on the SOFR contracts for the end of next year. And and maybe that doesn't happen, and that's not expe- that is certainly not expected to happen. But I'll lose my premium. Um, and and it just may be it may be, and it's very relevant. And I haven't said this, but um, the the Krugman Fed being crazy and hey, we're cutting rates. The economy is booming. We're oh, we're cutting rates. We're going to cut again. We're going to cut again. Um, that, that, that Krugman insanity. When the Federal Reserve historically, they've only done it in two previous occasions, when they've subjugated the domestic condition to bail out the rest of the world. That was 19, 1927 um, and, and, two, um, and 19, nine, late 1998. And on both occasions, you stoked up a profound uh, domestic uh, bull market in asset classes. Um, and so we, we may have another flare higher um, or, but I'm willing to miss that flare so I don't get engulfed. But if the flare happens, I'm willing to bet you that, you know, if, if the S&P is up 25% next year, I cannot say this. There's no one-to-one relationship. This is a risk statement. But if the S&P has another year like this, Bitcoin will be 200,000 minimum. So, um, you know, um, the cost of being wrong, I can be contentious, but the cost of being wrong, not that great. But wise people listening be like, oh, shut up. Uh, Bitcoin could be idiosyncratic. The S&P could be up 25%. There could be a scandal about Bitcoin. Non- you know, it could be a failure with an exchange or you know, digital wallets, um, and it falls. The yes, inverse could be true too. You know? yeah, S&P could fall and Bitcoin could go up. Yeah, there's a probability distribution, and you've got to take your comfort from that. Hugh, this has been an amazing conversation. I've loved so much about what you've said. It's been mind-bending in some areas, and um, uh, uh, obviously you're really passionate about a lot of the trades that you think about and about the global macro piece. Conscious of time and conscious of your time, um, I want to just say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's been a really, really great discussion, and uh, it will be fascinating to see if the dollar yen trade will play out as you said. Well, but what time is it with you, you guys, locally? 9 a.m. now. Oh, 9 a.m. Have you been up all night? Have you been at the pub? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> That's it tonight. Well, the, may, may I, because I, you know, I, I've got my eulogy to Michael Lang. Please. So uh, there's a position today, and we're way too early. Like we talked about the cut. So I'm not saying buy it today. I'm not saying buy it today. But it, um, I've, I've come to this position by vibing on um, my experience with Michael. Uh, and back when Michael and I were partners in London, uh, we bought uh, shares in Vestas, Vestas Wind Turbines. World, I think even today, the world's largest turbine provider, manufacturer. Um, and it, 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 you know, like life is capricious, good things happen, bad things happen. And, and oh my goodness, like there were really bad things happening back then. They massively overcommitted financially um, to a new installation. The damn blades didn't work. Uh, stock was on his ass. On his ass. Uh, you know, it was kind of back then, very much you could say it was a one of a kind business. Install base was enormous. They owned the technology. Um, and Michael was like, you got to buy the, you got to buy the glitch. And there's, there's a great precedent for this. It goes back into, if you read um, Adam, this is a made up name, but the, uh, this, uh, the nom de plume is Adam Smith and it's the money game. Great book about the emergent uh, bubbles in the, in the late 1960s. Um, and it has a story about um, Warren Buffett and his initial engagement with uh, American Express. And it's kind of fun because it's kind of apropos for some of the things we discussed here. Um, American, there was a guy called Tony DeAngelis. He sounds like a rapper from Los Angeles. But, I mean, he was, he was just a kind of mafia. I mean, he was a preposterous mafioso guy. And um, he, he was in <laughs> I love the fact you, it's so friggin' dumb. You, you couldn't make this up. People were like, get out of here. No, no. Uh, Tony DeAngelis had a, a salad oil company. Uh, and essentially soya beans. And uh, and there's money in the beans. And then the huge vats, big uh, production center outside uh, New York. And he went to the pawnbroker. And he's like, 
yeah. How much money will you get? Like, I'm, I'm looking for a line of credit. And I want to pledge you a thousand liters of premium salad oil. And the the pawnbroker, the credit provider is like, yeah, yeah. Oh, we're, beans, beans in the teens, baby, you know. Do you know that expression? I think the highest price of soybeans has been about 17 bucks or so in the mid-1970s. And probably the, the low white about $4, $4.50. And presently about $10. Uh, um, now, the pawnbroker was American Express. And, and what they discovered was Tony's vats, vats of salad oil. had It was water. You know, he was like cooking it. And... and in today's terms, American Express had to write off about four hundred million dollars, like to Tony DeAngelis, um, and the share price cratered, and actually there was a mini crash in the S and P, and and Uncle Warren, he stood up and he had the clarity, to, clarity to say, "This too shall pass," and when it passes, we will come back to looking at essentially what is American Express is a money printing machine, that credit card business, that franchises one of a kind. And he was able to buy it, you know, uh, preposterously low. So we, um, in a world of the overvaluation of everything, again, we, we, we have to seek contentious positions. And there's a huge, huge company today in America. And again, before I say its name, I am not recommending you buy it. It's going to get a hell of a lot weaker. But we are in the vicinity of it being um, a, a, a bragging Warren Buffett story. And that company is Boeing. And the glitch, my, and my goodness, what a glitch, was the, the fiasco of the 737 um, and the, the human tragedy. Um, and, and that's the stock price. I look at lots of data. I, I, I'm a time... I'm curious about time, and I know our time is over, is up. But um, see, I look at 40, 50 years of price data. I like 40, 40 year moving averages and, and the like. Uh, 40 years, too long. Uh, 40 month moving averages. And so B Boeing has had profound mean reversion, which is it's been beaten up. Everyone hates it. They've just had a, a an emergency rights issue, um, which begrudgingly taken up, but... I, I don't actually if it's been fully taken up. The, the stock is sliding. You know, U.S. stocks have surged after the election. Boeing's sliding. Uh, so the, the opportunity is I've seen the future. Um, aviation technology or engineering, I don't know why, but it is profoundly slow. The advances made in aviation have been in, in weight and cost reduction, um, not in anything supersonic. And... And there are two companies that dominate it. And they're essentially, they were created by sovereign governments. And in 10 years' time, that's going to be the same. And you might say to me, oh, the Chinese are going to do it. No, they're not. America will not allow it. The Europeans, we're talking about the EV industry, they're not going to allow Airbus to be taken down in the same sense. So we have the certainty there's only going to be two companies. And you got to think you make money. Uh, and Boeing's going to get priced to a level where it's deemed not to be a, a perpetuity. It's deemed to be a going concern risk. It has a lot of debt. And the litigation liability for these air crashes is already at 20 billion. Initially estimated at three, probably going to come in at 50 billion, you know. But the, the interesting thing is, who builds Air Force One? Yeah, you know, who's got the contract for Air Force One? Boeing, right? And what's their other business? The defense industry. If you actually looked a defense contract. We never talk about defense contractors except when there's a, a war, right? They're the best performing sector in America. Surprise, surprise, selling things to the US government is profitable, you know. Um, so I think what's going to happen, I think there's going to be a further big slide you know, question Boeing, and then I, then I want you to buy it. Um, and the US government is going to turn around and it's going to call it, it's going to call it what it is. Is going to call it a government sponsored enterprise. And it's going to say, we stand fully behind the debt of Boeing. And the Boeing debt, which it's not junk, but it's not far off junk, will then trade like uh, the US government. 
and that's a profound wealth transfer to the to the equity shareholders. So watch that situation, people. And that's that's my eulogy uh, to Michael Lai in New Zealand. I know that he will love that eulogy. Quite a glitch. Thank you, Hugh. I'll make sure Michael sees it. For listeners, Michael Lang is the CEO of NZ Funds and has um, a long history with Hugh and friendship, and um, so hence the eulogy in the moment. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and uh, we hope to see and hear from you again in the near future. Can I can I do a modest advert and then I'll go like if, so if, if anyone <laughs> go, is not if, if anyone is not revulsed. Uh, you can find me on Substack and Patreon, uh, Hugh Hendry. And you can find me on, on Twitter under that. Uh, and even on Instagram and, and, and YouTube. But I'm, I'm, I'm pushing things out and challenging my tribe. If you think you're a badass, if you think you're a troublemaker, if you're curious about the world, you know, find me on the web. What a great way to go. Thank you, Hugh. New Zealand Funds Management Limited is the issuer of the NZ Funds Active Income Series, NZ Funds Active Inflation Series, and NZ Funds Active Growth Series. Together, the NZ Funds Active Series, as well as the NZ Funds Kiwi Saver Scheme, the NZ Funds Managed Superannuation Service, NZ Funds Wealth Builder, and NZ Funds Income Generator. For further information or to request a copy of the product disclosure statement for each of these, please contact NZ Funds or visit nzfunds.co.nz. This recording is provided for information purposes only. The information provided is not intended as a substitute for specific professional advice on investments, financial planning, or any other matter. Past performance is not an indication of future returns.